chance to declare scriptural truth through song. But God, we know that there is a uh, wonderful benefit that we receive as a side benefit from doing as you command and assembling together and, and singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs to you and about you, God. And that's that we are exhorted, we are encouraged, we're reminded too. Yes, every week we'd rather have you, God. It is better to have Jesus than all these other things we listed. God, thank you for the chance we have to remind ourselves, exhort ourselves, and encourage each other through the singing of these songs tonight, God. And I pray for this panel that uh, your hand will be upon them, God, as they declare what you'd have them to declare tonight. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Man, please be seated. All right. Well, good to see everybody. Hello? All right, yeah, we're good. We're good. So, uh, this is Toby. If you haven't met Toby, Toby Ellis, he is the the leader of our men's ministry. And uh, they do, our men's ministry does Bible studies on Wednesday nights at what time? Uh, Seven o'clock. Seven o'clock. Yep, and this is is actually a topic that they've they've hit on recently, is what we're talking about tonight. So, um, oh, uh, let me bring this up for us, and I'll go ahead and give you all the, the main slide, the Nephilim. All right. So, um, Toby, just to share about how many weeks did, as a men's group, did you guys spend talking about the Nephilim? Um, so on this specific one, it was just a one, it was one lesson out of a six week study. Um, but me personally, I was looking into this about a year before. About a year. Okay. Yeah. So, so you spent a lot of, can y'all hear me? Okay. Frank, can you hear me? All right. Good deal. So, um, yeah, looking at the Nephilim, um, it's a, it's a fascinating topic. How many of you have ever read about the Nephilim before? Just raise your hand. Okay. How many of you have never heard of a Nephilim? Like what's a Nephilim? Okay, great. So it's going to be fine. It's going to be good. All right, let's start with, with, I know Nathan just prayed for us. Let's pray again and ask for the Lord's uh, wisdom here. Martin called in sick. He uh, is not feeling well tonight. So well, this was going to be a trio. Now it's just a duo. So, um, but that's, but it's going to be fun. It's going to be a lot of was good he, stuff. Was he, uh, Taken by a Nephilim? It may have been taken by a Nephilim. Yeah, I don't know. All right, well, let's pray together. Well, Lord, we love you. Thank you for your grace and faithfulness. And God, thank you for the opportunity we have just to gather tonight and uh, sing these great songs of worship to you and about you. But now also, Lord, just to dive into your word about a, an interesting topic that's, uh, that's so biblical and historical. And um, God, it's just an interesting topic. So give us understanding and help us to see, Lord, really how you're working through the whole process. So God, bless our time in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so if you have your Bible, you want to open it up because we're going to be flipping around some scriptures. You may want to, I don't know if you're like me, I like to highlight and underline in my Bible and take notes in my Bible it's, it's, so it's all just right there, right? So we're going to be in Genesis 6 starting off and um, we'll start with this passage, Genesis chapter 6 verses 1 through 4. This is where we see kind of the, the beginning. Of course, the word Genesis means beginning uh, and it's the beginning of this concept we're going to talk about tonight of the Nephilim. So um, so while you're, you're just, you're turning there. Um, so in the context here of Genesis six, it's before the flood, right? Um, you know, you had the Genesis, the creation account, Genesis one and two, uh, Genesis chapter three, we see the fall, Adam and Eve, they've sinned. They have uh, eaten the forbidden fruit. God has proclaimed the, the curses upon Adam, the curses upon woman, curses upon the serpent as a result. Chapter 3 ends with grace, where um, God, one, he removes them from the Garden of Eden so that they will not eat the tree of life, eat the fruit of the tree of life, and live in an eternal state in a fallen condition. It's God's grace there. So he brings them out of that, and also he covers them. So we see the first atonement. We get to chapter 4. It's the story of Cain and Abel, um, which Cain's going to play a part in tonight's conversation. But Cain, as you may or may not know, Genesis chapter 4, Cain and Abel are the two, the first two sons of Adam and Eve. 
Cain murders Abel out of jealousy, and um, Cain is then banished, and he's exiled uh, away from the family. He goes and settles and starts a family and a people of his own. Um, that's his interesting question I have at some point is, where does Cain's wife come from? That's another fun biblical question, but we're not dealing with that one tonight. But then you get to Genesis 5, and we meet Seth. And Seth is the third son of, of Adam and Eve, and he begins a line. And in that, in that passage, you know, it, uh, it's interesting how it compares. How this is Adam, was, when he was created, was created in the image of God. When, when Seth was born, he was born in the image of Adam. It's almost like there's a, a little bit of a difference, which we know is the fall. So Seth inherited that fallen status. Um, but then he goes on and talks about the descendants of Seth. And it says, in those days, people began to call on the name of the Lord. So all that is Genesis 1 through 5. That brings us to Genesis 6. And so here we, I'll just read this, and then we'll get into this and let Toby talk us through some of his study and findings. Um, two, two key terms we're looking at tonight, the sons of God. That's one conversation we're going to have. And then the Nephilim is the other conversation we're going to have. So I'll just read this, verses 1 through 4. It says, when man began to multiply on the face of the land and the daughters were born to them, the sons of God saw that the daughters of men were attractive, and so they took as their wives any they chose. Then the Lord said, My spirit shall not abide in man forever, for he is flesh, and his day shall be a hundred and twenty years. The Nephilim were on the earth in those days, and also afterward, whenever the sons of God came into the daughters of man, and they bore children to them. These were the mighty men who were of old, the men of renown. Okay, so, Toby, you asked the question here, who are the sons of God? Yep, so that's kind of the biggest key to understanding this, um, and you'll, so there's actually three different interpretations for this. Um, the first one is what is known as the Sethite view, um, and so the Sethite view is that um, the sons of God are the descendants of Seth that he talked about. And then, by contrast, the daughters of men are then the descendants of Cain. Um, and so the, the church has held this view since the middle of the 5th century. So this is, a, a, this is a view that is pretty popular in the church. It's a pretty common view in the church. Um, but that's the first time we see it is in the 5th the century, uh, Julius Africanus. He's the, he's the first one to write about it. Um, and he's the, actually the only one before the Council of Nicaea that does hold that view. Um, and then the first place you see this view defended uh, by anybody in church history is Augustine of Hippo, which you guys covered. Yeah, we did, but you say it wrong. Uh, Augustine. <laughs> That's good. That's a joke we had the other night. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, yeah, Augustine had it in the city of God. Yep. Right. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so, interesting. So, this, this view, so here, the sons of God are considered Seth's descendants. Correct. So, that's a Genesis 5 genealogy. Correct. Whereas the daughters of man would refer to Cain's descendants, which is more of the Genesis 4 genealogy. Okay. And so where that kind of comes from is if you look through Cain's genealogy, it talks about the man named Lamech, who is seven times more wicked than Cain. There's a uh, poem in there, I guess, where he says, if Cain's punishment was seven, I, well, I don't know exactly what it is, but it's like, it. so whatever Cain's punishment is, Lemex is seven times more than that. Um and then with Seth, uh, in his descendants, there's a man named Enoch, and that's the man that is said to have walked with God, and then he was taken. Um, so it kind of that's kind of where the Cain's line represents wicked humanity, and then Seth's line rep represents the righteous line of God's people. Yeah, I'm looking for the Lamech passage. We we meet Lamech in uh, yeah Genesis four, right? Yeah, it's yeah. There's a little poem here in verse 23. Lamech said to his wives, when he took, he was he's he the first one we know of that had multiple wives, I believe too, yeah. right? Which shows just a violent, oppressive kind of fella. He says, Ada and Zillah, hear my voice, you wives of Lamech. Listen to what I say. I have killed a man for wounding me, a young man for striking me. If Cain's revenge is sevenfold, then Lamech's is seventy-sevenfold. Yeah. Yeah. So he was just kind of a, a the epitome of the the downward spiral of humanity that was going so quickly because of the fall. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so like I said, that's that's the most pre this view has been held by the church for the of the three views. This one has been held by the church for the longest. Uh, but there are some objections to that. 
And that's what we'll look at next. But so Cain's lineage doesn't speak to anyone other than Lamech being wicked. Uh, Seth's lineage doesn't mention anyone other than Enoch and Noah being righteous. Um, and then ironically, if you look at it, when you go through the lineages, Seth's is the only one that actually mentions daughters. So uh, where it talks about the, the daughters of man being the lineage of Cain, Cain's lineage doesn't mention daughters. He obviously had daughters, but in his lineage, and there was women in his lineage, but Seth is the only one that specifically uses the word for daughter. Um, and then, to me, all of that is irrelevant, because by the time of Noah, which is the time period we're dealing with, everybody was wicked, regardless of which lineage they came from. Uh, only Noah was the righteous one. Um, and so the, the objection then is if the sons of God are supposedly from this righteous line of godly people, why are they constantly taking unrighteous wives? So Right. Yeah, and that's, those are all strong arguments. This last one um, is definitely the strongest. I right? agree. Because he's, as we'll see when we talk about the Nephilim, the Nephilim really refers to the giants, the giant people of old, right? And we'll talk a lot about that here later. Well, it, it makes no logical, biological, scientific sense, etc., that simply da daughters of Cain and sons of Seth would produce giants. There's no right. DNA. There's no genealogical, you know, reason for that, right? Correct. Yeah, you would agree with that. Huh? I agree with yeah. you. By the way, assuming what, what you, you, you don't believe this view. Correct. I do not believe this I, view. I don't either. Okay, good. All right. The next few. So this one is probably the one that the least amount of people have heard about. Um, it's the divine king's view. And so this kind of takes into account the common practice of just pagan cultures and the, their kings and their rulers just declaring themselves to be deity or they're associated with deity. We see this a lot like with Pharaoh. He speaks for the gods. If things are going good in Egypt, it's Pharaoh's. He's the reason for it. Um, if things are going bad in Egypt... God is, uh, like the gods are punishing the people through Pharaoh. So, thus the sons of God, they were rulers who forcefully took the common women into their harems. And so, that's kind of the, because Genesis 6 definitely has a, this was a negative, sinful action that took place. So, that's where the sin comes in, that it's multiple women being brought in, forced against their will into the, to the uh, marriage, into marriages with these wicked kings, rulers, whatever. Uh, so this is actually the second oldest view. Most people don't realize that. So we had the Sethi. the Sethi view, which actually is the newest view, even though it's been held by the church the longest. But this divine king's view, this actually came about in the second century by Jewish interpreters. And I think that plays a little bit into why they interpreted it this way. Uh, and then there was a guy named Rabbi Simeon Bar Yokai. I don't know how to exactly pronounce that, but right. sounded good to me. Uh, he uh, he condemned any anyone in the Jewish faith who did not accept this view, and so and this so the reason they kind of adopted this is this was bolstered by there's a Sumerian king list that was found in the region dating from this time, and many of the themes parallel Genesis one through eleven, um, and then it very heavily identifies the kings as being divinely appointed. Uh, and it identifies the Sumerian kings as gods. So that's kind of where this interpretation came from. But Yeah, it, just interesting question on that. Did, you kind of alluded to this, but why do you think it seemed advantageous to the Jewish rabbis to have this view? And so much so that he would, that Rabbi Simeon Bar Yochai would say, if you don't have this view, you cannot be in the in the synagogue or whatever. Yeah, so the third view that we'll talk about is the fallen angel view that we'll get into it, but... I think second century, post-Christ, post-resurrection, post-fall of Jerusalem, the Jewish leaders had a very big advantage to try, or a, a motive to try to dissuade people from believing that spiritual beings can become flesh. And that would be because they're trying to distance themselves from Christ. That's right, from Christianity. Yeah, it's very good. All right, good deal. So let's look at some objectives, object, objections to the divine king's view. Yeah, so one of them is a lot of people are, they say the reason that we believe, or this view believes that 
the the women were taken is because it says that they took wives for themselves. Um, but there's nothing in Genesis 4 that indicates that they were not willing participants. We see Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. This language is all the same. It's they took wives for themselves. And I think even in the case of Isaac, when he took Rebecca as his wife, Isaac wasn't even there. Rebecca willingly came with the the servant to become his yep. wife. Yep. Um, uh, and so this was main, like so we talked about this, but the this view was mainly adopted by those who wish to distance themselves uh, from the sons of God terminology uh, to reject Christ's claims to divinity. Yep. And again, this view fails to even address right. how there could be giants. How Correct. this. This would produce giants. There's no mention of that at all. So, do you do you hold to the divine king's view? No, no, me neither. Which brings us to so the we have the fallen angel view. So this view is that the sons of God are in fact fallen angels that lusted after human women, women, and then made offspring through through them, and those offspring were giants. So what's interesting to me, and one of the most compelling things to me about this one is this is the oldest view. There is no historical writing that supports any other view until the second century AD. So if this is, if this is written 4,500 years, like right. around the time of Noah, or if this, if this happened around the time of Noah, all of Jewish history up until the second century held this view. So just to be clear, this view says, right, that Genesis 6, when it says the sons of God, that's referring to fallen angels, and then they procreate with human women that produced giants, all right? So let's make sure that's, anybody thinks that sounds kind of weird? <laughs> uh, absolutely, right? It's like, well, when reading like The Hobbit, what is going on here, right. right? You know, okay, but this is this is scripture and we, you know, approach scripture as the inerrant word of God, accurate in all of its history, et cetera. So um, just fascinating, this, this Obviously, you see why these other two positions might have been espoused is because this one, which is the most historical view, and honestly is the, most, is the truest to Scripture, in my opinion, would have been espoused to try to expose. Well, surely we can't believe that a fallen angel procreated with a human woman, right? It just doesn't sound like it could fit. Right. But It's weird. Here we are. It, it, it's weird, but how many other weird things are there in Scripture? Balaam's donkey talking. How weird is that, Right. Or how weird is it that God would become flesh to become one of us? That's, you know, that's, that's hard to, to fathom that God would do that, yet he did, right? So it's not beyond the realm of our faith, yeah. right? So, okay, continue. Uh, so, the, so the next evidence for that is that the earliest copies of the Septuagint, uh, they translate the Hebrew sons of God, which is B'nai Ha Elohim, they translate that to Angeloi Theo, which is angels of God. So the, the scriptures that Jesus read, that the, the, the disciples read, they all, when they read it in Greek, the wording is that the angels of God came and lusted after. Yeah. So, so the Septuagint, what is that? So about roughly 200 BC, so it's 200 years before Christ, 70 Greek scholars 70, LXX is similar to Septuagint. That's the Roman numeral for 70, for the 70 scholars. They got together to translate the Hebrew Old Testament into Greek because Greek was the common language of the culture of that day because Alexander the Great, 330 B.C., had conquered most of the known world. He had spread his culture, which is called Hellenism, throughout, main, throughout most of the world. And so just like today, English is really the, the international trade language then Greek would have been the international trade language. So their goal was to translate the Bible, the Old Testament, into Greek. So that's, that's what the Septuagint is. And so what Toby's mentioned here is when they translated this phrase, they translated sons of God into the Greek form, which would be angels of God. All right. Yep. Um, and then just Josephus, Philo, when they write about it, they hold this view. It's very clear they hold this view. Um, and then many of the Apocrypha and the Pseudepigrapha, they also support this view, which I really don't care that they support this view, but it does speak to what the culture and the, the everything surrounding this yeah. thought. So let's explain these. So who, who was Josephus? So Josephus was a, uh, just a Jewish, Jewish historian. He's actually a Roman or a, a Jewish general that fought against the Romans and then Roman 
culture is weird. He was adopted by Titus, which is weird. He became As, the emperor. Was yeah, the general, yeah. then became the emperor. Yeah, and yeah. so, I mean, grown men getting adopted by grown men yeah. is weird to me, but that's yeah. what happened. But And, and as, as a result of that, so part of that is he wrote down the Jewish history yeah. of uh, just of the history of the Jews, and he yep. breaks it up in several books. But yep, and he's got. It's interesting. Jo- Josephus writes a lot about Jesus, even though Josephus was not a follower of Jesus, right. a Christian. He he writes a lot about it. Philo, what about Philo? Who's that guy? Uh, I'm drawing a blank right now, but um, I am. I, he's also another historian. Yeah, but. he's a he's a historian that chronicles some of the history of of this of this time period. He lives a little bit after Josephus, but yeah, very. Yeah. His writings are um, are well respected in the historical community. So he writes about this. So the apocrypha. What's the apocrypha? Uh, so the apocrypha. I, I I think most people who are Catholic are probably familiar with the. Anybody apocrypha. Familiar, anybody know what the apocrypha is? Okay, yeah, the word apocrypha means hidden writings. Um, and it's uh, it's a few more books. That if if you've ever been a Catholic, I, who grew up Catholic? Somebody grew up Catholic. So um, the, the the apocrypha is included in the Catholic Bible. So it's it depending on how it's organized. It's up to eighteen additional books. Some of those are consolidated, um, but but the, it happens between the the Old Testament period and the beginning of the New Testament period. So they're what we would call intertestamental. And it's really interesting thing to study. So, um, so when they when they translated the Septuagint, the Hebrew Old Testament did not contain the Apocrypha. The Septuagint they did bring the Apocrypha into the, the Septuagint uh, in ninety six A.D. ninety no that's not right ninety one A.D. Uh, the early church had a council in the city of Jamnia to determine what which Old Testament are they going to embrace as discerning you know which one is the is the God intend to be. Um, the Old Testament. And so at that council in 91 AD, um, they, they saw that the Hebrew, they, they chose the Hebrew Old Testament as the official Old Testament of the church. And that's the way it was, you know, up until the Protestant Reformation. And then after the Protestant Reformation, 1566, the first council of Trent, the Catholic church chose to bring the Apocrypha back into the Bible. Um, so that's where, that's why today the Protestant Bible, Old Testament is 39 books. And the Catholic version has, again, how it's organized, it's like 48 books. It's really 18 different books, but some are consolidated into one book. So that's that's what the Apocrypha is. Um, the Pseudepigrapha is basically just writings claimed to be written by biblical characters, but there's no support that they actually... Yeah. And like it's usually written hundreds of years after those people lived, usually in languages they didn't speak. Um, yeah. So they're considered to be false. Yeah. Yeah. But interesting, all of these writings all point to this yep, reality. They, they all hold this view just in, in the culture that, again, nobody had heard of any other view for 4,800 years. Yep. Okay. Now you make an interesting point here at this bottom out that this view definitely has the most biblical support. So let's kind of walk through these. Yep. So Job 1. So Job 1, 6, and uh, Job 2. 2-1, uh, both use that same phrase that Genesis 6 does when it talks about the sons of God. It calls them the Bene Elohim, sons of God. And so Job 1-6 and Job 2-1 both say that when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, Satan was also with them. And the reason we know it's not just human leaders or, or humans coming before the Lord, it takes place in heaven because it, Satan comes with him. And God asked Satan where he's been. He says, I've been coming to and fro and through the earth. So clearly this isn't taking place on earth. So this meeting that they're having is taking place in heaven. So it has to be, in in Job, it has to be angels that are having this council with God. And then it's the same word, exact same word that's used in Genesis 6. And Job is from around the same time as Abraham. So, yep. um, and then in Job 38, 4, 7, we have the same phrase again of the sons of God rejoicing at creation. So it'd be really hard for humans to be at creation rejoicing when they weren't created yet. <laughs> right. It's good. Okay. That's strong. What about Deuteronomy 29, 32? Uh, so both these uh, chapters paint the picture of nations being divided according to the number of the sons of God. So the fallen angels 
then are later worshipped as false gods. So there you have the fallen. Which would not make nearly as much sense if sons of God were right. sons of Seth or right. divine kings. Right. Okay. And then Daniel 3, um, Nebuchadnezzar, actually one of my favorite Bible characters. But he, so we all know the story. Dan, or Daniel's friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they get thrown into the furnace. And then it's, it, somebody brings it to Nebuchadnezzar's attention that there's a fourth man in the fire. And Nebuchadnezzar uses the phrase Bar Elohim, and this part of the scripture is actually written in Aramaic. Bar Elohim is the Aramaic equivalent of Bene Elohim. And so he sons says, of he sons says of God. Yeah, he says it looks like there's one of the sons of God in there. And then later when he's speaking to Shadrach Meshach a bit ago, he said, your God has sent his angel to protect you from the fire. Hmm. So, good connection. So yep. at least in his mind, that phrase, Bar Elohim, B'nai Elohim, is referencing an angel. Okay, it's good. Psalm 29 and Psalm 89. Uh, so this uses a little bit different phrase. This is B'nai Elim. Um, it's just a shortened version um, of B'nai Elohim, Elohim mm -hmm. but it's, it's definitely in there. In those psalms, it's definitely God speaking to heavenly beings. I, th I think Psalm 89 talks about the, I think, I think that it's translated as the holy ones, but I'm either getting Psalm 89 or Psalm 82 confused, but they do reference God meeting with angels in heaven to discuss what's happening on the earth. Yeah, and so here it's cool. This is not just an Old Testament right. thing. This is a New Testament also. So Jude and 2 Peter refer to this. So yep. um, the fallen and, angels. And so in Jude and 2 Peter, and I'm a big, uh, I advise everybody, like if you're having trouble understanding something Jude, go read 2 Peter chapter 2. And then if you're having understanding something in 2 Peter chapter 2, read Jude. Because 2 Peter seems to be talking about things in the future tense, while Jude talks about them in the present tense. And so they kind of fill in the gaps for each other. Uh, but both of them, in the context of Noah, speak about angels engaging in sexual immorality. And so it's... And why would it speak about that? Right. If, if that couldn't happen. Right. right. It's good. Interesting. All right, well, let's look at some objections to this fallen angel view. Yep. So if it, these, these are pretty popular objections, and they uh, do at first appear to have some merit and... But so one of them is that Jesus states that in Matthew 22, Luke 20, and Mark 12, um, that angels do not marry in he angels in heaven do not marry. And so the way he so we'll, how that comes about is the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the leaders of Israel, they come to him and they say they give him this ridiculous scenario of a man who has a wife, he dies, his brother takes her as a wife as biblically commanded. This happens seven times, so she ends up having seven husbands over the course of her life. They all die before her, but when they get to heaven, they ask Jesus who the, who's going to be her, her husband in heaven since she had seven biblically-minded husbands. Yep. And then Jesus says, well, you don't understand the scriptures or heaven. Essentially, he says, for in heaven, we are neither given nor, we are neither married nor given in marriage, but we will be like the angels in right. heaven. That's what he says. So what is your, so let's just deal with that objection. What, what is your response to that? Um, there's one key phrase there of in heaven that uh, these are fallen angels that uh, if you go back to Jude and Second Peter, they say they forsook their natural yep. position or abandoned. That's their, part of the rebellion. Yeah. yeah. Very good. All right. Second objection. Uh, so uh, that only Christ has been called God's only begotten Son. That's Hebrews five. That's everybody knows that 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 Jesus uh, is God's only Son. So how could he? Ha so how could God have other Son. sons of God? Um, and that's just a, a difference. Uh, so when Jesus is God's only begotten Son, that's a a relational Son. Whereas the sons of God is more like a title or a positional authority. They are, they're above humans, but below God as the fallen angels. Yep. Until the resurrection, it will be above yep. angels. Yeah. 
That's good. New Testament refers only to believers as sons of God. Romans 8, Galatians 3, Galatians 4. Yeah, so, I mean, it, but again, so when the New Testament refers to believers as sons of God, it's always in a future tense. We will be sons of God. We're, when, we, when we're raised in the resurrection, that's when we become the sons of God. Okay, and we're adopted. We're not yep. begotten. Right. It's another difference there. All right, so... Um, and I, I, this, this objection says, if this activity is the cause of the flood, I'm not sure that's the only activity is the cause of the flood, but I'll let you address this. If this activity is the cause of the yeah. flood, then God is unfair to punish all of humanity. Yeah, so this, this plays on the objection that it's the, so because it's in context of the flood, that the fallen, it, it can't be just that there's fallen angels procreating with humans and creating these hybrid human fallen angels because... Why would God punish all of humanity for the the sins of angels? Um, but immediately after Genesis 6, 1 through 4, it says, in relation to humans, it says our thoughts were evil all the time. Yeah. But I also would like to point out that God destroyed all flesh, animals, and yep. uh, all living it was things a, it was a for the sins reboot. of humans. Total reboot. All right, objection. This is vile, disgusting behavior that God would not allow to happen. Yep. So, again, I think this is the weakest one because the Bible is full of vile, disgusting behaviors Absolutely. that God doesn't allow to happen. Yep. So, And this sounds like pagan mythology. Gods and human procreating to create demigods. Yeah, I think <laughs> Satan's not very creative. And so uh, when, he, when we have all these false gods and these, and these myths from ancient times, I think they're just twisting and uh, I don't know what's the right word, but corrupting. just, yeah, corrupting, corrupting the true story of the fallen angels coming in to the daughters of man. Yeah. Yeah. So we're going back now, look at the verse again. So we talked about the sons of God and the daughters of men. That was the easy part. Now let's get to the fun stuff, right? Yeah. The Nephilim, the Nephilim were on the earth, right? So first let's just look at this word nephilim a little bit and and ask the question you know first what are what does this word come from and who are the nephilim all right just look at that first what does this word mean so most of you if you if you have heard of the nephilim you've probably heard that this because this is a a popular opinion and you'll see it everywhere other than in academics that the word the hebrew word for nephal means to fall so many of people just assume that the nephilim means the fallen ones referencing the fallen angels. However, you will not find that in any Hebrew lexicon anywhere because linguistically, nephal would not become, or it wouldn't become nephilim, it would become nophilim in the correct tense. And so nephilim is a direct transliteration. So instead of just translating the word, we just Transliterated. Transliterated. We did so. the same thing with baptism or baptize. The Greek word is baptizo. We just made it baptize in English. We didn't try to translate into an existing English word. We just simply took the Greek word and made it an English word. Does that make sense? Same thing with Nephilim, right? Yep. Yeah, so so a correct rendering translation will have it as giants in English. And then the Septuagint translates it as gigantes in Greek. So Nephilim just means giants. All right. Very good. So let's look at Nephilim in Scripture. Here's where it gets interesting because, I mean, I'd say for a, for a long time um, in my understanding of Nephilim, it was all just a pre-flood thing. Like the Nephilim would have been wiped out with a flood. That is not the case. So let's look at Nephilim in Scripture. So we saw in Genesis 6 before the flood, but here we are in Numbers 13. Now, who writes Numbers 13? Who writes Numbers? Moses. Moses. So, you know, well, Abraham, the flood was way before Abraham. Abraham lived in 2100 B.C. Moses lives in about 1450 B.C. So we're way after the flood, and yet we're seeing this written right here. Yeah, and what's really fascinating is so Nephilim only occurs three places in Scripture. It occurs once in Genesis and twice in Numbers 13. Yep. But as I was studying this, like, it, you, you find an interesting thing. You, you pull on a thread and then just the thread just keeps coming and coming and coming, but there's, it goes way beyond just the three places where it's actually mentioned. Yeah. So here we are. Numbers 13. 
It says, at the end of 40 days, this is about when the, the, um, the spies, remember when Moses sent the 12 spies in the land of Canaan to scout it out? They come back and they make their report. Let's dig into that report a little bit. At the end of 40 days, they returned from spying out the land, and they came to Moses and Aaron and to all the congregation of the people of Israel in the wilderness of Paran at Kadesh. They brought back word to them and all the congregation and showed them the fruit of the land and told them, we came to the land which you sent us. It flows with milk and honey. And this is its fruit. However, the people who dwell in the land are strong and the cities are fortified and very large. And besides, we saw the descendants of Anak there. Remember that guy's name. All right. We're going to continue on here. The, Am the Amalekites dwell in the land of Negev. The Hittites, the Jebusites, the Amorites dwell in the land, hill country. And the Canaanites dwell by the sea and along the Jordan. But Caleb quieted the people before Moses and said, Let us go up at once and occupy it, for we are well able to overcome it. Then the men who had gone up with him said, We are not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we are. So they brought to the people of Israel a bad report of land that they had spied out, saying, The land through which we have gone out to spy it out is a land that devours its inhabitants, and all the people that we saw in it are of great height. One more. And there we saw the Nephilim, the sons of Anak, who come from the Nephilim, and we seem to ourselves like grasshoppers, and so we seemed to them. So what, what could that mean? Well, it sounds like there's Nephilim in, in the land of Canaan at the time yep. that the spies go in to, to deliver this report to Moses. Yeah, so some interesting things about this report. Yeah, so if you read before this, um, the there's grapes in the land, and, and one cluster has to be carried on a pole by two men. That's how big the grapes were, which I thought was fascinating. Um, but uh, they give a report that the people of the land are strong and of great height, the cities are fortified and huge, and the descendants of the Nac, of a Nac, who came from the Nephilim were there. So I would like to point out that the descendants of a Nac are a separate argument why they shouldn't go in from just the people being strong and great. Um, and then it talks about the land devouring its inhabitants. So it's likely a reference to cannibalism. In every culture where we see giants, you they're associated with cannibalism. If you've ever read the Odyssey, one of the first islands that his crew goes to, uh, there's giants there. Most of the men get wiped out because they're eaten. Um, even just in, in nursery rhymes, we have Jack and the Beanstalk. He, he's told that he's going to be ground up and the bones are going to be made for bread. And, so, and that's what we read to our kids at night. Yeah, right. Yeah. Lovely. And then what's... fee what, fi fo fum. That's right. Well, what's really fascinating, though, is Joshua and Caleb's rebuttal to the people doesn't object to any of this they don't say you're just making it up there's no nephilim in the land mm. the the cities are great they're like yeah all that's true but god is going to give us the land and the people of the land will be bred to us not that it's they're saying that there's going to be cannibalism but he's flipping that narrative that we're going to be eaten if we go into this land it's like no god's going to destroy all these people and we are going to eat well eat well yeah, yeah. not gonna eat the giants right. gonna, yeah right you eat those big old grapes yeah, that's right yeah. That's good. All right. So really interesting. Um, so this brings us to a, a really fascinating topic um, as you start unpacking the scriptures here. Um, it's already 553. All right. We'll, we'll see, how, we see how we do with this. We might, we might pause and take some questions because we want to be sure. sensitive to time. Let's pause and take questions. We might come back and tackle the clans of giants next time. All right, so it's, 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 we've thrown a lot at you, a lot of stuff just on sons of God, daughters of men, and the word Nephilim, and beginning to see that the Nephilim exist post-flood, right? That's, that's a big deal, right? And as we'll see, you know, the, the clan, and the clans of the Nephilim, clans of giants, I mean, it's going to make sense where Goliath comes from. It's going to make sense. We'll meet this King Og in the Old Testament and so anyway, but want to hear any of your questions that you may have up to this point. All right, we got one over here, Stevie T. Hold, hold on one second, Steve. We're recording this, so we want to capture all the questions. Yep. My wife warned me to keep it, uh, keep it nice here. <laughs> um, all right, so if, if there's giants post-flood, 
how did that happen if the only people who survived the flood was Noah and his children? Did they have like some yep. recessive DNA giant Could be, gene? yep. I'll let you go. So, so there's a couple of, I guess, I don't know where they come from. They're probably Jewish. Um, answers to that question, where did the giants come from if the flood killed everybody but Noah and his family? So one of the most ridiculous ones, I think, is that there was a giant. So it's actually King Og is the, is the theory. But that A, Nephilim, because they were giants, were able to cling on to the side of the ark and just hold on for dear life until the end of the flood. Ridiculous. Yeah. Um, the other one is that possibly somebody on the ark had a distant relative that was a Nephilim. Therefore, the Nephilim DNA is preserved through their bloodline. Um, many people suggest it could have been one of the son's wives because they weren't part of the family. Um, there's actually a tradition that Noah's dad actually gets into a confrontation with Noah's mom about the fact that maybe she was with one of the fallen angels. Yeah, and, but, and, and Martin, Martin actually had read up on that, and he was going to address that tonight. But he read up on, yeah, um, Noah's dad. So I guess it's Noah's mom. Yeah. Yeah. That um, there's this Jewish theory that his mom had Nephilim blood in her. Yeah. But I don't, I don't know. I, I think it just is easily explained by looking at Genesis 6. 6, 1. It's yeah, I'll go back, go back up to there. So in there... So if you look at your Bible, verse 4 says the Nephilim were on the earth in those days and also afterwards. Some translations put the word when there, and that's where all the confusion comes in. The better translation is whenever the sons of God came into the daughters of men. So that Whenever could have been before and after yeah, the flood. It says and also afterwards. And then so the analogy that was given that I, that I was in some of the studies I was given is that when I go to the store, I buy milk. I mean, okay. But whenever I go to the store, I buy milk. It's more specific. It gives more timeline. And so the implication in that, if you translate it correctly, is that this act could have happened more than once. Yeah. There was a season pre and post flood. Yeah. And so maybe there's multiple reasons for that. So we talked about Genesis 3 where God pronounced the judgment on... Uh, Eve and on Satan, and he says that the seed of the woman will crush the seed of the serpent. So it, a, a popular theory about why this happened is that you have these evil spiritual forces trying to mess with that human DNA and try to corrupt the woman's seed before we can get to Messiah. the Messiah. Yep. And, then, and then another reason it might happen is that once the, because they're pre, the Giants are very prevalent in the land of Canaan. So it also would make sense that once God promises Abraham that he's going to inherit that land, Satan again tries to mess with God's plan through this means of creating giants. Yeah. Good. Great question, Steve. Don? Yeah, could there be a, a correlation between sin? Just, you know, the, the extent of more sin? becomes more uh, uh, defect in the DNA, which causes the giants, you know. You, we, ha we see birth defects because of different sins. We just, the sum of the sin creates, We when you see that, you see it larger. So you're saying is Nephilim just a, the word giant just kind of a metaphorical term to re refer to giant sin, more, a lot more sins. That kind of, is that what you, I want to make sure I'm understanding your point right. Uh, uh, both. Uh, both and. That and. Where it's literal, and but it's physical. also metaphorical. Yeah. yeah. And so like, I think he was saying like, could just sin have corrupted oh, humanity oh. so that it's creating giants through Yeah, you look deformities. at like, I'd like say the, if that's the case, we'd be seeing a lot of giants today too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Chuck. Who we got Chuck? All right, Toby, you're answering this one. <laughs> it has always been considered that 
sin was passed down through the male bloodline. Hence, Jesus being born of a virgin was born without original sin. So if you have these Nephilim being born without a human father, do you have a whole race of people born without original sin? I didn't hear all of that. Help, help me out. Uh, so he said, if, if these giants don't have human fathers, they have angels as fathers, then you have a whole line of people being born without original sin. It's a good point. Yep. They don't have, they're not born in the image of Adam. They're born in the image of a hybrid of image of Adam and image of a fallen angel. Yep. Which is sinful. If a fallen angel is sinful, they're, that's a good question. I don't know the theological answer to yeah, that. Yeah, I don't, I don't have a theological answer to that either. But. It's going to be fun looking that one up. Ron? So, so let me ask you, Chuck, do you, do you believe in one of the first two views? Okay. So you agree that they were giant? You're just asking a question that you've puzzled on. I, I got you. I got you. Fair. Very fair. Very fair. All right. Ron? So in Genesis account, when they reproduce, they reproduce after their own kind. So they're, they're talking about animals in that particular portion. One of uh, J. Vernon McGee's comments on these is that the angel are not the same kind as men. But along with Chuck's point, what if the angels, the fallen angels, inhabit physical men but gave them extraordinary powers? That's a good word. So, yeah, that's true. In Genesis 1, which totally debunks macroevolution, but is it created each according to its kind. Yeah, so in this case, you would have procreation and it kind of be its own kind. Is that kind of what you're getting at there, Ron? Well, mankind. Right. We, we couldn't procreate with cattle. Right. But they're just separating delic hosts from yep. mankind. Yep. It, it, I get it. So, it'd be a, so you're saying that could be another objection to the sons objection. of God referring to fallen angels. Unless physically had a man taken over. By oh, possessed by. Host. Yeah. It's a good, interesting yeah. thought. So uh, a fallen angel would possess a man to procreate through. Interesting theory. So, so I do know, I mean, I don't. I agree that the Bible is clear that you only produce after your own kind. However, if I if I remember correctly, I don't think that is said of humans in Genesis one. It is only said of animals, and uh, only the animals produce after their own kind. But I mean, obviously, humans only create humans. That but yeah, but that is not something that. And then it also plays into the fact of how do you define created in the image of God? So hmm. there's there is an element of being created in the image of God that we get to participate in creation, that we um, have reasoning and um, just everything that makes us human, you could also apply that to angels other than we are physical mortal beings and they are not. Hmm. Yeah, and that's, that's interesting. So really, kind of go back up to the... Yeah, so where's the, i got to find that Numbers 32 passage. Where's that at? Um, nope. I'm look, looking for the Numbers 13 passage. Okay, thanks. Okay, the, the, very, la the very last one, verse, yep. We saw the Nephilim. So this is the inerrant word of God. So here, the Nephilim were there after the flood. So biblically, it's, it's, it's not an argument. We, we right. know the Nephilim were in the land of Canaan after the flood, right? So now we have to wrestle with, as biblical students, how do we reconcile some of these questions, you know, um, which is, that's the whole pursuit of growing and learning, right? It's when you read scripture, say, okay, I understand that this is true. I totally, yep, this is true. The Bible says it. This is true. The Bible says it. I don't know how that and that equal to, can work together, though, you know? And this is just the process of rightly dividing the word of God. So the answer is here somewhere, right? Right. Um, but of the, the three views that exist, um, you know, the Sethite view, the divine king's view, and this one, I mean, 
the first two views make no in my mind make no sense of why the 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 Jewish people would be scared to go into the promised land from the Nephilim if they were just a different you know yeah. just just regular humans, but the fact that they would be Nephilim and giants that's that's another huge reason to be afraid. Yeah, and and also to be clear too, the Bible never calls these giants anything other than men, so it's not like they're some other kind of man. They're just giant men. And it, and even in Genesis, in Genesis 4, it says they were the mighty men of old, hmm. the men of renown. So yep. it, it's clear that they are, they are human, but maybe their DNA is altered by... Maybe they were possessed. That's a good, yeah. plausible answer to how that mechanically worked, right? Yeah. Good. Interesting. All right. Ed? I do have a question. The Book of Enoch mentions Nephilim. What is the validity of the Book of Enoch as a historical text? Yeah, something about the Book of Enoch. Yeah, he said, what's the validity of the Book of Enoch? That's a good question. Jude actually quotes the Book of Enoch. The issue is, it for whatever reason, when the Old Testament um, scholars were compiling the old books of the Old Testament. They, they um, had a kind of a three-tier test by which they discerned which books were supposed to be included in the canon. It's, pro- it's called the process of canonization. The word canon means rule or, rule or norm, right? And so the canon was the, the standard of which, against which all truth is measured, right? And so as they developed these three test questions to discern this, it was, was it written or supervised by a prophet or recognized spiritual leader, like a scribe? Second, um, did it apply to all generations? And third, was it theologically consistent with other existing works, right? So that was a three test of the Old Testament canonization process. So for whatever reason, the book of Enoch um, did not meet all three of those criteria. But it is interesting that Jude does cite it in the New Testament. But then the issue is, I mean, we still have the book of Enoch today, or so we think. There's a lot of skepticism as to where the book of Enoch we have today is the original book of Enoch that Jude, from which Jude quotes. So there's been so much um, corruption of that book or questions in that book from the very beginning, it's just never been considered part of Scripture. Does that make sense? Interesting read, no doubt about it, but uh, not sure it's part of Scripture. Yeah. All right, Barb? Was Goliath a Nephilim? What she, she said was, was Goliath a Nephilim. Um, we'll get to that in the next session. Um, he's connected, yes. Spoiler alert, yes. Spoiler, but we'll, we'll, we'll talk show about, you how. Yeah, we'll trace that next time. Yeah, it's good stuff. You might get to this later, but what happened to him? What happened to them? Uh, I mean, that's a good question. I, other than at least the at least the, at least the first one, the first group were clearly destroyed in the flood. The second group were wiped out by Joshua, and then finished off by King David. But why we don't have them today, I don't know. I I would venture to guess that if the original purpose was to destroy God's plan for salvation. It's already been accomplished, so it'd be kind of futile. That would be my personal opinion on why we don't have Nephilim today. All right. Yep. I had had a question. So after the flood, when um, Noah was naked and Canaan saw him and told his brother Shem and Ham, you know, um, it says, Cursed be Canaan, a servant of the servant, shall he be to his brothers. And I just wondered if that had to do with, I mean, he was banished away from where they were, that they were vulnerable, and it was like a generational curse to them, and the gods came down and mated with their women again. But it's not said in the Bible, but I just... Yeah, I'd say it's a possibility, because, you know, Canaan is the son of Ham, who settles the land of Canaan, Canaanites, that's where they were. Uh, The possibility, yep, it's a good thought. Yep, Sean? I was just curious as to whether any of the the 
the first two views are, is there anyone that's still holding on to those today? Oh, good question. Who who holds on to those? I haven't researched so, that. So the second view, I don't I don't know any. I don't. I, the Divine King. In studying view? this, this is the first time I'd ever heard of that view. Uh, the Sethite view, I think, is actually probably the pretty predominant view among the Protestant uh, seminaries. Even I mean, I don't know. Josh, is that what they taught at seminary, or did they even cover it? Okay, so I mean, we we talked about it in my seminary. Um, you know, it was a long time ago, most closer to the actual events. Uh, but um, I, I was taught the two views. I was taught the Sethite view, and I was taught the uh, fallen angel yeah. view. And my professor, I remember him saying something like, I hold the fallen angel view, but I'm in a minority. Yeah. So he yeah, said I, something like that. I think, I think it, throughout church history, the for, so from Jesus to today, predominant scholarly opinion is the Sethite view. But that's not the historical view. Yeah. Of. But I, I'm not sure, Sean. Like, if you went down, like, popular, like, John Piper or John MacArthur, I, I'm not sure. I think yeah, MacArthur I, holds to the fallen angel view. Yeah, I mean, it's pretty but, obscure, so most people don't even, even it's, think yeah, about it. Yeah, right, right. But good question. All right, any other questions? Yep. So I know that modern archaeology has found some remnants of, like, the uh, King Solomon's Temple and that. Have they found any evidence of the giants existing or the Nephilim, any, any archaeology records indicating that this is still even possible? Uh, I, th I think there are. I mean, I always am skeptical about going into that kind of realm with this because this fantastical stuff is often fabricated just for the sake of creating a story. But, I mean, I, I think there are stories that you can read about Giant skeletons being found. I haven't looked into the validity of all of those, but um, I don't. I don't think anybody at least questions that giants lived in the land of Canaan around the time of Joshua. I don't even think scholars object to that. Yeah. Which slide would you like, Pastor? Well, there's a whole section on Wikipedia on giant <laughs> human skeletons. I don't know. I have to. I want to dig into that. Um, that's a great question. Yeah. Yeah. All right. We're about at. Well, we're we're 12 minutes past. But any last really hard pressing question? Yep, Christopher. Getting your, getting your steps in, Nathan. <laughs> so how do we apply this to our spiritual lives today? Like, what is the spiritual importance in our walk with God of this? What do you, what do you ask? He said, what's the spiritual importance of our walk with God today? To Well, I think, um, obviously, not a ton directly. Um, but I think how we approach and handle the teaching of scripture does have direct impact, you know, so case in point. So you're re you're studying scripture about predestination, but you also study scripture about human responsibility. How do you get to where you reconcile those together or do you, right? And so when you read something that scripture clearly says and teaches like Nephilim, like giants of old, but then you read a passage or that just seems, I just can't make sense of that in your mind. How do you, how do you handle that? right? Like how do you handle the Trinity? How God is one, yet God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. How do we, how do we handle these things that are a little bit beyond our understanding? Do we just reject it? Which I think those that take a Sethite view, that's, that's kind of a step you're taking. Just, well, it can't mean that because I don't understand how that could be. That's not a good excuse not to believe scripture, right? Um, so I, I, that would be an indirect application is just, just how we process scripture and how we study scripture and take and apply these truths to us. Obviously what you believe about the Nephilim has no direct impact on your walk with Jesus today. Right. Um, but it does in how,